More people die from avoidable medical errors in the United States than from gunshot wounds, breast cancer, and vehicular accidents combined. For me, this is a transcendent moral problem. And when you start to unpack what the root cause of the problem is, you notice that the data is trapped. The data that can save these lives is trapped in subterranean strata of paper and obsolete IT systems. A few years ago, a small team and I started to think about ways to frack that data, to pull it out of the ground and make it useful for clinical care services. Our story today, though, begins in 1853, a long time ago, where the denizens of Erie and Harbor Creek were very angry because the New York state line going through the northwest corner of Pennsylvania was insisting that they change the gauge of their railroad track. They were using six foot gauge and the New York state line wanted them to use four foot six inch gauge that was being used in the rest of the country. Now at that time, Erie was the gateway between the east and the west and that created a lot of jobs. Now, unloading peanuts from one boxcar to another doesn't sound like a great job unless it's your job. And as Upton Sinclair teaches us, it's very difficult to teach someone to not understand something when their job depends upon them understanding it. So the citizens of Erie were ripping up rail lines and burning down bridges. And they had the support, they had the emotional support of their governor, a guy named William Bigler, who said it was the right and the duty of the state to look after the benefits and the welfare of its citizens. This issue ended up on the desk of President Franklin Pierce, brought to him by none other than Jefferson Davis, he who would lead the Confederacy 10 years later, who wanted, Davis, uh, who wanted Pierce to send in the troops to protect the mail. Now, Pierce demurred. He's actually a hero in this story. I don't want you to think that somehow having all the same rail gauge all throughout the country is an unalloyed advantage, that it's an unalloyed benefits. It has pitfalls and hazards all its own, just like Dan, uh, Dan Gear teaches us from cybersecurity. You don't want a monoculture in all situations. In World War II, it was to our great disadvantage. Hitler moved troops around because the Europeans had already ad agreed to a, a standardized gauge. But in many cases, and in most cases, to be fair, we as consumers, we benefit from that. For example, the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, they describe the rules of what you can put in your gasoline. It's the bane of all business people. But as consumers, we love this because we go to the gas station and we tank up and we don't know whether the gas is coming from the tar sands of Canada or the desert sands of the Middle East. We just pump it up. Or think about the electricity in your home. Now, if you're environmentally conscious, you might be willing to pay a few extra pennies to get that electricity from a renewable resource. So, but the juice coming out of the sockets, the juice coming out of the standardized sockets, that's taken care of for you by the power company. So let me put aside questions of transport and energy and change the topic slightly on the, on the issue of standards to something that's a little closer to your wallet and quite literally to your heart and soul. We'll start with money. If you've ever used direct deposit or transferred money from one bank to another, you know that there are standards that enable the financial system to operate. There's SWIFT codes and IBAN numbers, and here in the United States, we use something called the ACH, the Automated Clearinghouse, that reconciles interbank transfers. It's how come when we go overseas, those of us who are pri privileged to travel and use an ATM, we actually can get money in the local currency. But let me run a different scenario by you. It's a make-believe one. 
You go to your neighborhood bank, you want to take out 20 bucks. They know you, you know them, you've been doing business with these guys for years. And they, you pull out your government issued ID, they, you've got $20 in your bank account, and the teller looks at you knowingly and says, before I give you the money, can you please tell me what do you need it for? You'd be outraged, right? You'd think, jeepers, I think it's time to find a new bank. But you're feeling especially tolerant today, and you say, okay, I'm just gonna tell you I need to buy some groceries, or I gotta pay my rent, or uh, I wanna open up a credit card account with the funny guy on the TV. And they say, mm, okay, we're gonna send you the money in about seven to 10 days and for a small transaction fee. Now you're really ready to go find a new bank. But we tolerate this when it comes to our health information. Exactly this. There are hospitals today in the United States that can't transfer medical information from one department to another. Never mind giving it to you. Not going to happen. Now, why is that? Well, the vendors of the software that enable this data interoperability, they have two concerns. And the first one, you've got to be fair, is legit. It's just like what was happening in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1853. They own the railroad. They own the digital railroad. So they don't want to give that up. They don't want to enable somebody to go around them after they spent all that time, energy, and money, and by the way, enjoying the monopoly rents. Why do they need to change? They don't want to change. So I'm not saying it's legit. I'm just saying I'm sympathetic. I understand why they'd be reluctant. But the second reason gets me. The second reason is nonsense. The second reason is there aren't any data standards. Uh, okay. Actually, that's not true. So let's talk about health data standards for a second. So it ends up at Veterans Affairs about six years ago. We recognized that problem. Veterans wanted access to their personal health record. And the secretary decided because he could, that he was going to give it to them. So we said this to our veterans. We said, if you want your health records, we're going to give them to you, no questions asked. Period. End of story. And because you in the industry are saying, well, there aren't any data standards, I'll tell you what, we'll make one. We'll make it super easy. It's very, very simple. And, and we're going to use this to uh, give the ve veterans their records, and you can use it too. And oh, by the way, when you outside, when you decide, when the industry decides what the gauge should be, what the standard should be, we'll use yours, no problem. So this was the genesis of the Blue Button Program, giving veterans safe, secure, complete, unfettered, and reliable access to their personal health information. It was announced by President Obama in 2010. Since then, millions of people have used this. VA, Medicare beneficiaries, people who get health services from the DOD, that's about three million people right there just using Blue Button, and then about that many people in the private sector. So the question is, what did VA know that the people at Harbor Creek did not know? Well, a couple of things. First of all, there's a gigantic difference between uh, things that you can touch and feel things that you can put in your hand, and things that are data. I'll give you a very good example. At home, I speak English, and my wife, who's from Germany, speaks German. Now, when we first got together, we didn't actually speak each other's language, and we had to learn a few words. And we did that well enough so that we could create the perfect translator. Now, he's in the audience today. His name is Jacob. <laughs> My point is that we didn't have to have a 3,000 word vocabulary and perfect grammar to be able to communicate with each other. And it was exactly that genesis, it was exactly that idea that brings us to the blue button. The mathematical term for this is abstracting the namespace. And if you're interested in learning more, there's a wonderful book by David Weingartner called too big to know, and he describes this in a really elegant and accessible way. I encourage you to read it. So what does that mean with regards to health information? 
Well, Peter is typically a guy's name. Claudia is typically a woman's name. Penicillin is a medicine, whether you can spell it correctly or not. Silver Spring is a place, sore throat is an indication. And we could categorize, catalog all of this information even though it was unstructured, even though we didn't have semantic interoperability, even though we didn't know what the syntax would be when we finally got the, uh, the records, the models from outside. But we could build those records and make them interoperable enough. And it was sufficient. And this was how we busted through and fracked the data out of the VA. So you say, well, great, so what do we do now? Isn't paper safer than medical records? And that's a good question, it's true. We've spent now over $20 billion, $20 billion digitizing hospitals. And in most cases, they are much farther along today than they were eight years ago. But this is not true in the physician's offices. The physician's offices still are largely paper. And I'll tell you what this means. There are people who work in the health services industry that are reaching out to the doctor's offices and asking them to send the paper records to their house. Now, they're not trying to do anything illicit. They're not trying to do anything illegal. They're actually trying to provide superior service to their clients, to their patients, and to their physicians because they're trying to get around the mailroom that introduces a couple of days of delay. Or there are some patients that when they go, preoperative patients, when they go to their doctor's office to pick up their records before their surgery, and they get the wrong one. It wasn't that the nurse wasn't paying attention. It wasn't that the patient wanted somebody else's record. People make mistakes. This happens all the time. So the solution to this is to digitize records with good identity management and make them available to people easily, simply, and reliably. So what would you do if you had your electronic medical record? And how do we speak to the vendors who say, oh, that's too expensive, we can't do that? A friend and mentor of mine, a guy named Roger Baker, used to say, tell me how much it would cost to solve the problem if you actually wanted to solve it. We think that this is inexpensive. <clears throat> There is nothing more, more important. It could be a matter of life and death to gain access to your health information. You reduce the number of tests. You make sure that the doctor is seeing the right diagnosis for the right patient. You make sure that the pharmacist can see the drug-drug interactions. But there's one more that I want to talk about very briefly. So we're working on a project now, which is an open source registry for clinical trials research. This is work that's being supported by the Arnold Foundation, by the Global Alzheimer's Platform, by MedDecision, and by PwC. And when we're done, which will be soon, we'll have a destination. We'll have a place for people to upload their blue button records or just come to us for the first time and we'll serve <coughs> as a clearinghouse between patients that are looking for medicines that can save their lives and the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture them. Fracking your data from rocks and from blockheads should not be so hard. Where I work, uh, we have an expression which is data to the people. It is more important than you know and easier than you think. Thank you very much.